Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Genome Webinars. I'm Julia Caro, Managing Editor at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator today. The title of today's webinar is Novel Methods for Improving de Novo Transcriptome Annotation with Long Read Transcript Sequencing. This webinar is sponsored by Lexogen. Our speaker today is Richard Kuo, a bioinformatician at the Roslin Institute at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. You may type in a question at any time during the webinar, and you can do this through the Q&A panel, which appears on the right side of the webinar presentation. We will ask our speaker your questions after his presentation has concluded. Also, if you look at the bottom tray of your window, you will find a series of widgets to enhance your webinar experience. So with that, let me turn it over to Richard. Please go ahead with your presentation. Uh, hi, my name is Richard, and uh, I'm talking about, uh, as Julie said, novel methods for improving de novo transcriptome annotation with long read transcript sequencing. If you want to tweet these slides, feel free to. Uh, this is my Twitter handle here, Genome Rick, at the bottom. So please include me if you do uh, decide to tweet. So I'm from the Roslin Institute, which is probably most well known for cloning Dolly the sheep. And I think this really highlights the interest that our institution has with respect to understanding the genomics and transcriptomics of non-model organisms. So by de novo uh, in my title, what I really meant was that uh, to create a transcript annotation without information from external species. Uh, so I know this is a little bit confusing because typically de novo transcriptome annotation refers to a, a transcriptome without information on the genome, but uh, primarily I'll be focused on a transcriptome with respect to the genome. However, the wet lab methods that I'll be talking about really apply to both, so it's not uh, completely a lie. So first I want to start with the genome. Uh, this is kind of the way I look at the genome. It's uh, for a eukaryotic species. It's a linear sequence that essentially serves as a coordinate for the information that's stored within the genome. Now, when we look at the transcriptome, you see that there is quite a bit of complexity, and this is due to transcription start sites, transcription end sites, and alternative splicing. And all of this can sort of combinatorially combine to create complexity that I believe is many folds more complex than the genome. So it's not to say that the genome is simplistic, but rather that uh, with all the complications or complexities of the genome, you can imagine that the transcriptome is even sort of a higher level of that. And that's what has made the transcriptome somewhat elusive for a lot of different uh, people working with species that don't have as much sort of um, uh, the budget, if you will, to, to uh, sequencing and other types of studies. So I want to start out with this kind of abstract model of a transcriptome annotation. So this is how you would see it as viewed on a genome browser. And so we see you know, the genome and then the low size that the genes uh, have across the genome, as well as the alternative transcripts for each gene. And what I want to point out here is that you have this sort of heterogeneous kind of mixture of different types of gene models uh, across the genome. And this is really, I think, what people are trying to get at when they're doing transcriptome annotation or transcriptome discovery, to understand you know, where all the genes are and what all the transcripts are for those genes. And I'll be referring to this figure in future slides. So before I kind of move on into the long read, I want to talk about a little bit of the short read RNA-seq and why that's sort of being phased out, at least in my opinion. So short read RNA-seq has been a cornerstone of transcript annotation for quite a while now. But there were some real limitations with short read that I think were overlooked during that time. Uh, so the major one, I would say, is that you can't really guarantee accurate transcript models with short read RNA sequencing. And the reason for this is because you're trying to piece together these little short reads into a transcriptome assembly. And that leads to a sort of a massive combinatorial puzzle, which in certain cases can be unsolvable. So to demonstrate this, I've created this diagram, which is actually from a paper I published in 2017, so you can read more about it if you're interested. But basically what this shows is that for one gene, so let's say that you have two possible splicing situations, splicing model A and splicing model B. And one of these is correct, and one of these is incorrect. Now, if you took your short read uh, uh, coverage from the top, and say you had infinite and even coverage across the entirety of this gene, 
So you typically, you would use the splice junction read coverage to chain together the exons. But what we see here is that both models have the same type and number of junctions, which means that even with perfect short read data, this would be a, mathematical, a mathematically impossible problem to solve. So there's actually no way of determining the difference or whether the gene is actually splicing as in model A or as in model B. Now, if you've worked with short read RNA-seq, you'll know that you never get anything, I would say, anywhere near perfect. Uh, the, the coverage across the genome is quite strange, and a lot of the transcript assemblers have been built to try to deal with that. So this just goes to show that you can get a lot of ambiguity with respect to your transcript models, which can then lead to other problems downstream, which I'll demonstrate uh, in a future slide. So to sort of reemphasize, the short read mentality is that you use coverage, read coverage over low size to predict features. So high coverage means more sort of certainty that something is there. Uh, conversely, low coverage is typically equated to noise, okay? Now the issue with this is that it leads to, um, among other things, inaccurate start site predictions. So if you look at the figure or the diagram at, um, at the bottom, you'll see that we have in the dark red, the uh, transcripts as annotated by ensemble and then sort of verified the longer transcript by PAC biosequencing in the light red. So that's isoseq in the light red. Now, if you look at the, uh, the read coverage from the short reads uh, sort of below the dark red, we see that there's uh, almost no coverage at that very five prime exon, or I would say this is noise level coverage. So using this kind of short read data, you would never be able to find that five prime exon. And so you wouldn't know that there is a transcription start site there. So that's one of the issues with respect to short read. And now another issue is something that I call the noise floor. So for a long time with short read RNA-seq, people said that uh, the more coverage, the, the deeper the sequencing, the better information you get. So that's what you should go for. But the problem is that, uh, as we've seen with our data sets, there's something called the noise floor, which is essentially uh, an amount of noise or transcriptional noise that you get, which actually increases uh, as you sequence deeper. And what this means is that you can't really sequence uh, past the noise floor, or if you do, you don't get any benefit from it. And so to demonstrate this on the figure in the upper right, what we have is a situation that I call a gene merge. So we have two genes as an entity of ensemble verified by uh, PAC bio isoseq. And then if you look at the short read assembly, it actually merged the two genes into one. And this is because, as you can see at the top there, there is enough transcriptional noise bridging the two genes to confuse the transcript assembler to create this sort of merged gene. And this isn't sort of a rare situation. In this specific data set, we found about 950 genes were merged in this fashion. And so you can imagine that this would cause a lot of problems with the transcriptome annotation uh, because you're essentially creating these monster genes that don't really exist. Now that brings me to the long read mentality. Now the mentality is deceptively simple, but actually there's a lot of complex uh, caveats that kind of go forward from that. But essentially, the long read mentality is that one read equals one transcript. This is because you take your RNA templates and you don't fragment them. You keep them whole and you create a cDNA copy. And then you sequence from end to end that cDNA copy of your RNA template. And so you don't have to do any assembly. One read is sort of a perfect representation of what your transcript should look like. But as you'll see in the next slide, the problem with this mentality is that if we consider what's actually within your RNA sample, it's actually quite a mixture of things. And so at the top, we see processed RNA. So the yellow is the five prime cap, and the blue is the poly A tail. And processed RNA is really what people are going after with transcriptome annotation, because these are the sort of full length uh, functional units that we want to identify. Um, but in addition to processed RNA, you'll have degraded RNA. So degraded RNA will typically be degraded from the five prime end, so you get the three prime end, but less coverage on the five prime end. And we know that this occurs to quite a degree from short read data looking at coverage, uh, as we saw in the earlier slide. Um, so you'll get those. And that for, is sort of in vivo, just happening naturally, and also uh, exacerbated by sample handling. Uh, in addition to degraded RNA, you get unprocessed RNA. So because things are being transcribed uh, constantly, you will catch RNA that haven't been processed, so the introns are still there. And so it, it doesn't, and in, in, in many cases, it doesn't have the five prime cap. So you have something that has sort of this uh, un, uh, non-functional, unprocessed RNA structure. Um, and then you also have genomic fragments. So these can either be uh, fragments of the genome that uh, sort of got into your sample somehow and weren't sort of cleaned up, 
or in certain cases it can be a non-classical RNA or like a read-through RNA that it was somewhat uh, truncated and then um, and then added in. So you have this sort of mixture, right? And so when you sequence, you're going to pick up all of these things essentially. Now, what that looks like is essentially if you see uh, the degraded RNA here, so you have the red full-length model at the top, but then your degraded RNA will look at look like the sort of cas what I call a five prime exon cascading event, where you get reduced representation on the five prime end, but the three prime end is all sort of matching, and so uh, and, and in many cases you don't actually get the true five prime end for that transcript. Um, genomic contamination typically looks like a single exonic gene, uh, sort of somewhere randomly within the genome, and then your unprocessed RNA will either have all of the introns intact. Uh, as compared to the, the dark blue model at the top, or um, some of the introns intact, so sort of like mid-processing, essentially. So this brings me to sort of uh, breaking down what happens when you're doing long-read transcript sequencing and what the issues are with long-read transcript sequencing. So first of all, five prime degradation. Uh, there's two major major problems with five prime degradation. One is that every time you sequence a degraded product, that's a waste of a read because it doesn't give you the information that you want. Um, and number two is the ambiguity ambiguity of the transcription start site. So again, kind of going back to the short read data, you really would like to know where your true transcription start site is. And if you have degraded products in your sample, then that's going to give you that ambiguity right back to where short read was essentially. Um, the other issue is that since you're using oligo DT priming, you can, in some cases, have internal priming. And what that looks like is a truncation of the model on the three prime end. So you can see in the bottom right, that's what an internal priming model would look like as compared to the full length model. Um, and then also, you can have genomic contamination because you can have either um, actual uh, genomic DNA or you can have uh, these read through transcripts that have poly A stretches within them, and the DT primer will bind to that and then sort of treat that as, um, as an RNA, and then essentially you'll get this, uh, this sort of noise in that sense. Okay, so how do we address that? Well, um, one really, I think, good way of addressing it is using something called five prime cap selection. So essentially all this means is that you're going to select for RNA with intact five prime caps. So the five prime end um, after processing should have a methylated cap, which essentially protects it from degradation. So if you see that five prime cap, then you're, you're pretty sure that that is the true transcription start site. Now, there's some interesting kind of benefits that you get uh, from what we've seen using five prime cap selection. Uh, one is that uh, you obviously you filter out degraded RNA because the degraded RNA won't have the five prime cap, but you also filter out genomic fragments because genomic fragments won't have a five prime cap. And then another interesting thing is that we, compared to sort of non-cap selected libraries, we see a reduced representation of the unprocessed transcripts, presumably because when the transcripts get the five prime caps, it's almost like at that stage, you're more likely to pick up ones that have been already processed. So by selecting for the five prime cap, you're biasing against the unprocessed transcript. So five prime cap selection actually does a lot to sort of clean up the RNA library to get the kind of transcripts or the RNA that you actually want to sequence. And in our situation, we're currently using the Teleprime kit from Lexigen, which I'll go into detail um, in a bit. So just to give you an example of uh, you know, what this looks like within your real data, this is an extreme case of five-prime degradation where we had a non-cap selected library, which you can see at the bottom, and then we compare that to a five-prime cap selected library. And what you see is in the non-cap selected library, we actually never even got the full length of the transcript. Actually, it's, it's less than half of the full length of the transcript. And you can see this is quite problematic because had we not done the five prime cap selected library, we wouldn't have even known that we were missing you know, more than half of that trend. And this would have led to a lot of issues with respect to identifying the open reading frames and then identifying coding potential. And also, obviously, if you're looking for promoters, you know, the promoter is not going to be at the end of that non-cap selected model. It's going to be where the, you know, the transcription start site is at the, uh, as shown in the five prime cap selected model. So this is a situation where it really demonstrates the ambiguity that you have when you don't do five prime cap selection. Uh, and then going into sort of like the efficiency of sequencing, here at the top you see the teleprime uh, sequences for the library and then a non-cap selected. And in the non-cap selected what we see is sort of all these, uh, what I was talking about before, the five prime cascading exons um, models, uh, basically are, are representations of the degraded RNA. So all of those degraded RNA 
are useless for your transcriptome annotation because they don't represent a true transcript. And so every read that you're spending on that is a read you're not spending on something that is more interesting, another unique transcript, essentially. Now, <laughs> inversely, there are situations where you have real five prime cascades. So this is a model as predicted by Ensemble, where you see that sort of cascading event. However, these are real transcript models. And so if you don't do five prime cap selection, you would never be able to identify when these occurred because they would look just like a degraded product, essentially. But when you do the five prime cap selection, then you can have more assurance that, yes, actually, this is a true transcription start site. So these are real models, essentially. So to kind of get an understanding of the real difference in amount of degradation within a sort of like that you would get with a non-cap selected library preparation versus a cap selected library preparation, uh, I created this metric, which I call a degradation signature. And essentially what this is, is it's looking at the, the, the um, essentially it's like the motif of having that five prime cascade. So you collapse the transcript models or the reads that you get uh, in two ways. One is the capped method, which is assuming that uh, if you have a transcript that has identical three prime end, but uh, a different start site for a different exon, those are different transcripts. In the no cap one, as long as the three prime end matches, then they're all collapsed into one. Okay, And so no cap is a much more aggressive way of collapsing. And this is actually how uh, ICC3 standardly, or it does their standard sort of collapsing to, because it just assumes that you have five prime degradation. Now, if you look at the difference in the number of models between the cap collapsing and the no cap collapsing, uh, that is your degradation signature. And so essentially, uh, for the standard library prep, we, we got a degradation signature of 47%. So a higher degradation signature means more degradation. And then the teleprime library, we had a degradation signature of 13%. And what I want to point out here is that you can't really have 0% degradation signature because you have real situations uh, like I showed before, where there's a real sort of five prime cascade. So um, the, the important thing to note here is that the drastic difference in terms of the degradation signature comparing sort of the standard library prep versus five prime cap selection. Uh, now, if anybody here has used Teleprime already, they might have used Teleprime version one and had issues. So actually, PacBio was experimenting, um, as far as I know, with Teleprime version one way, way in the past when they were just starting with IsisSeq. And they had issues with it because there were some problems because uh, it wasn't designed for IsisSeq. So uh, there was low yield, which meant that you had to have a lot of starting RNA. Um, it was also biased towards shorter transcripts. And there may have been some possible introduction of impurities that uh, caused loading to have problems, essentially. Uh, but Lexigen, uh, we've been working with Lexigen and other groups have been working with Lexigen to sort of make Teleprime work much better for IcSeq. So now they have version 2, which is available. And version 2 is designed for long read transcript sequencing. And so what we have is high yield. So if you start with 2 micrograms of RNA, you're going to get uh, likely 2 micrograms of CNA or more. Obviously, this depends on RIN score, but that's what we've seen from our uh, from our tests, essentially. And the length distribution is um, pretty much similar to the standard, standard library prep, so same thing there. And then uh, the CNA is uh, pure now because we worked for the cleanup to, to get it so that it loads very well. And so what this all means is that uh, essentially with the new efficiencies and everything, it's basically the same cost to run Teleprime as it is to run a standard library prep. So in my mind, it's kind of like a no-brainer uh, if it's the same cost, but you kind of get this added benefit. It just makes a lot of sense. Um, so it's just something that we recommend. Now, moving away from five prime cap selection, I want to talk about uh, transcriptome sequencing saturation. So what this means is trying to sequence the entirety of the transcriptome, right, picking up everything. So just to kind of give you some context, uh, let's say you have a one, gig one gigabase genome and you want 1x coverage. Well, if you have 10K uh, read lengths, then you're going to need 100K reads to do 1x coverage of that. If you have 100,000 transcripts and you want 1x coverage, you need 100,000 reads. So same, basically the same number of reads to pick up 100,000 transcripts at 1x coverage. OK. But uh, basically, the genome is, you know, all somatic cells will have the same genome. And so once you sequence the genome, you're done. But every cell and tissue has a unique transcriptome. So you kind of have to keep doing this for all the cells and tissues that you're interested in, um, which means that it can become expensive. So you really want to maximize the efficiency of sequencing for picking up all the transcripts, essentially. 
So to demonstrate um, why this is actually a bit more difficult than sort of 100,000 transcripts equals 100,000 reads is that um, we, we know very well that transcripts are not expressed all at the same level. There are, you know, your housekeeping genes, which are highly expressed, and then you have, you know, things like tissue-specific uh, genes, which are expressed at a lower quantity. So here we have gene 1, 2, and 3. Gene 1 and 2 are highly expressed. Gene 3 is lowly expressed. And when you start to sequence that, what you'll usually find is you pick up gene 1 and 2, but you don't find gene 3. And in many cases, gene 3 is the more interesting gene because it's the one that is very specific. It, it has some a deeper function other than just sort of regular metabolistic um, kind of functions that every cell basically has. So in order to understand kind of how much sequencing we needed to actually pick up uh, all the transcripts, I created this sort of simple mathematical model, which is all I'm saying is that um, let's say you have a transcript, and the ratio of that transcript, the abundance ratio, is a 1 in 100,000. That means that every time you uh, take a read, you sample a read, you have the inverse of that uh, probability of not sampling that transcript, right? So if you just keep multiplying that, that's the probability of not sampling that transcript with each additional read. And what you kind of want to get is uh, close to 0% probability of not sampling. So basically, close to 100% probability of getting that transcript. Uh, so if you have that situation uh, where you have 1 in 100,000, to get near 100% probability of picking up a transcript, you need about 800,000 sample, uh, 800,000 reads, which is shown in the, the table uh, on the right. Now, to show that this isn't sort of a, an, a wild estimate, uh, we have on the left so the human genome annotation, and here we see that there's 200,000, about 200,000 transcripts within the human gene annotation. And uh, this is a little bit controversial, but I would say that actually even for human and mouse, they're not really done annotating it. I think there are more transcripts, primarily long non coding RNA, uh, which are still not annotated. So I think 100,000 is a reasonable number to estimate based on. But the problem is, even if it's 100,000 transcripts overall within your tissue sample, the distribution of those uh, transcripts won't be even, right? Like I said before. So what we did here is we looked at the transcripts per million, or the TPM, for chicken cerebellum RNA seq. Um, and basically, we looked at, uh, for each unique transcript, how abundant was it within the sample. And what you see here is that most of the transcripts within the sample are expressed at less than 10 TPM. And actually, the, the predominant fraction is at 0 to 1 TPM. So let's assume you wanted to find a transcript at 1 TPM. Well, 1 TPM means 1 transcript per million. And what that means that in order to have near 100% probability of picking up that transcript, you would need 5 million reads. Um, to exacerbate that even further, in the current isis 3 uh, pipeline, uh, they have this HQ filter. So if anybody's run this, you'll know they have an HQ filter, and that's what goes uh, through to your actual models. To pass the HQ filter, you need at least two reads for a transcript. So you can imagine that this can be quite problematic. You want to sequence all the transcripts within your sample. And now, obviously, this is dependent upon the, the distribution of transcripts within your sample, but this kind of goes to show that there's a lot that you need to kind of deal with in terms of sequencing to get to the really interesting transcripts. Um, so in order to combat this, we use something called normalization. And basically what normalization is, is just making all the expression or the, the relative abundance of each transcript as uniform as possible. Now, uh, here's an example where we did a normalization and a non-normalization for a brain sample. And in the orange, what you see is a non-normalized brain. And what I want to point out here is that huge peak that you see at 1,200 base pairs uh, was actually caused by two genes. So those two genes took up 37,000 reads, which is roughly 10% of the sequencing. So this is what I mean by the issues with respect to overabundant genes causing inefficient sequencing. Um, and another thing I want to point out is that a lot of people like to pool their samples to get sort of more information or to, to sequence more transcripts. But if you have a situation like this where you have one of your pooled samples or uh, one of the constituents of your pooled samples has a really high abundant um, expression for very few genes, that kind of poisons the pool and it reduces your overall sampling effect. So uh, that's one thing to look out for. Um, another way of looking at the benefits of normalization is looking at the number of genes that you get with normalization uh, as, as opposed to not having normalization. So here we see that we picked up about five times the number of genes 
uh, per read, so FLNC is a usable read, uh, with normalization. So it's a significant increase in essentially your ability to pick up transcripts um, and, and unique genes. Now, the reason I have this slide is because I, I've talked about this before, and I, I just talked about the DSNase method. So the two normalization methods are currently available, the DSNase or double nuclease method and the column-based method. Um, now, the DSNase method we found to be problematic, but apparently some people saw my slides before without hearing me talk and didn't realize that I was saying that was problematic as opposed to uh, promoting it. And I'm going to explain in the next slide why it's problematic. So the double-strand nuclease method works by, well, both normalization methods work by essentially taking your double-stranded cDNA, denaturing them so they're single-stranded, and then renaturing them. And the idea is that the highly abundant uh, transcripts will renature uh, at a higher probability, and so the remaining single-stranded transcripts are sort of a normalized or more uniform distribution of your unique transcripts. And so then the, the whole thing is, okay, how do we get rid of uh, the double-stranded uh, transcripts? And so in the DSNase method, you get rid of it by using this enzyme, which cuts up all the double-stranded uh, the templates. Um, now, there's two main issues with this. One is that it eradicates high abundance genes and, and genes that are similar to high abundance genes, and it also creates artificial transcripts. And so uh, I don't have proof. I mean, I don't know exactly if this is the, what's going on, but I came up with this sort of cascade effect theory for why it eradicates high abundance genes. And essentially what it means is that if you're cutting up the double strand nucleases, uh, you're creating these little fragments that will have a higher rate of denaturation and renaturation. And they can renature on something, on another gene or transcript that's the same or, or just similar for that specific point, and then it'll cut that. And so basically, the high abundance genes will be cut up and create templates for eradicating anything that looks like it. So that's problematic, and we saw that within our, uh, within our data set for the DSNAS method. And then in terms of creating artificial transcripts, it's kind of a similar situation where like take these two real transcripts on the right that are in green. Um, if they're cleaved just right, uh, then they can recombine or renature. And then during pl uh, polymerase amplification, they'll fill in so that basically it's a chimera between the ends of the two different transcripts. And you get this artificial transcript. And the problem with this is that these are actually really difficult to detect or to differentiate because they look like just a different isoform. There's not much signal there to indicate that they're not a real isoform. And so these two things make DSNA, um, I would say, not favorable as, as a method of normalization. So the other form of normalization is the column method. And it, it's difficult to perform, and it's biased against longer transcripts, but these things can be kind of addressed. So based on the way you do it, you can kind of work around that. Um, but it's much more gentle. So you just use a substrate that uh, preferentially binds the double-stranded DNA. And so this, you collect the single-stranded, and then that's your result. Okay, so moving on to IsoSeq analysis. This is a basic diagram I created for kind of going through the entirety of the IsoSeq processing. And there's, it kind of comes down to two major things, which is pre map correction and then post map error correction. So uh, in, in this sort of magenta color, this is pre map error correction, and then in the orange is the post map. And I'm going to go into this in more detail in the next slide. So the one thing I really want to address is pre-map error correction because this is sort of the hot topic when IsoSeq first came out because they had some issues with the overall quality of reads due to the read lengths and, um, and the uh, raw error scores, essentially. Um, so people came up with different ideas of doing pre-map error correction. And pre-map error correction means um, correcting the reads before you map them onto the genome. So one idea is the long read error correction, which is basically taking your long reads and trying to cluster them together based on sequence alignment and then using that sequence alignment to error correct. Now, the problem with this, as you can see, is that you're taking two highly erroneous sequences and trying to cluster them, cluster them together, which means that you actually, you're either going to be over greedy and cluster the wrong things, or not greedy enough, you're not actually getting good performance. And so it's kind of like a trade-off either way. Um, so that's one of the issues we saw with long read error correction. And with the new sort of Chem 3.0 PacBio uh, sort of reads, you get like 100 kb reads average, y you kind of almost don't need that anymore. Um, with short read error correction, the idea was you took like short read RNA-seq data and you mapped them onto your long reads to error correct. But the problem with this is that um, if you had an area in your long read that was a high density of error, 
then you could align the wrong short read there and error correct the wrong way again. So you're actually influencing it in the wrong way. Now, the thing that I suggest is reference-based or post-map, which means that you map the reads prior to any uh, sort of log read or short read error correction onto the genome. And that way you can see from that mapping if the errors occurred in a, in, near a spice junction, which would be sort of a critical error profile since that might affect your spice junction call and thus your open reading frame predictions. If it occurs in just the sort of internals of an exonic region, it's actually not as problematic because you know that it's going to probably be just the same as the genomic. Um, so this is something that we suggest doing. So uh, to kind of deal with this, I uh, created TAMA tools. So TAMA stands for Transcriptome Annotation by Modular Algorithms. And so TAMA Collapse is the first line in the tool. And basically, after you map your reads to the genome, you can use TAMA Collapse to do genome-based error correction, uh, collapsing redundant reads, and you get a ton of information about what happened uh, with your data set, like the error rates and things like that. And, you, and there's a feature that I have now which basically looks at uh, pileups of errors near the splice junctions and allows you to filter them out because essentially those would be your problematic regions. Then there's TAMA merge, which allows you to uh, merge annotations, uh, or FNMD predictor, which I'll talk about uh, a little later, and TAMA go, which has a bunch of helpful little tools. Um, if you want to access this, this is free to use. You can access it using this uh, GitHub, my GitHub repo, and feel free to contact me about it because um, I really like to develop it and, and try to make it better for people to use. So going to sort of the, the pipeline, so you have your map reads, so SAM, uh, sorted SAM file, use TAMA collapse, that gets you the transcript models. Then you can use TAMA merge to get your merge transcripts, uh, and then the ORF and MD predictor gives you something that's kind of like a reference annotation, and I'll show you in a bit what that means. Um, but TAMA collapse is, I think, really cool because it uh, does the error correction based off the reference genome, which is, I think, a better way to do it. It's very tunable. It's actually meant to be tuned specific to your organism, um, which you can read in the wiki and you can ask me for information about. And it gives you very detailed reports as to what actually happened. So you can see if there's a weird model, you can look into the reports and see, okay, where, what was the error profile for this model? How many reads actually supported it? Uh, what was the sort of difference in the reads with respect to each other and things like that? Um, and, and it does give you something like an expression-ready annotation file that you could feed into sort of like a Callisto or something like that if you wanted to do quantification using short read data. Um, another thing that's important about Tama Collapse is that uh, it currently is the only collapsing algorithm that also deals with five prime cap selected libraries. So all other collapsing algorithms assume that you'll have five prime degradation and will do the non cap uh, um, non cap way of collapsing. And so basically, it's the only one that if you did five prime cap selection, you can use this and then uh, realize these situations where you have real five prime cascade in your models. Tama merge was meant to merge um, essentially the, mainly the transcriptomes across IcSeq projects, uh, but it also allows you to merge with other sources, and it allows you to merge with other sources while giving priority to the features that the sources are sort of more like better at, essentially. So you would expect the transcription start sites and end sites of an IcSeq project to, to be really good, so you can give those priority of one, and you expect the splice junction calls for your RNA-seq to be good, so you give those priority um, uh, for the splice junction calls. And then you expect um, a reference annotation to be the best, right? So it allows you to merge in a way that is kind of smart uh, for the kind of data sets that you're working with. So it's quite nice, and it also gives you all of the information about what was merged and things like that, so it gives you lots of really good detailed reports. And also with sort of SQL 2 now and the number of uh, transcripts that you get or the reads that you get, um, you often have to uh, split your, your collapses. So you have to split your SAM files to do collapsing. So Tom and Merge can re-resolve that. Um, so it's, it's got a lot of functions, essentially. Now moving on to the ORF NMD prediction. So uh, ORF NMD stands for Open Reading Frame and nonsense media decay products. So the idea behind this uh, tool is that it'll identify the CDS region for all the transcripts that you uh, find, and it'll match it to um, a protein coding gene that's known in the uh, UNIREF or UNIPROT database. And then it'll tell you the frame, and it'll also tell you if maybe it's a nonsense media decay product. 
So in a nonsense media decay product, you, what you see is that you have a, a stop codon that's uh, 50 base pairs upstream of the last splice junction. So it gives you a lot of information that's almost kind of like uh, a public annotation level of information. Now, the other cool thing about it is that it also identifies if you have possible five prime degradation. So it looks at the open reading frame and it says, oh, okay, did, did we actually have a start codon for the open reading frame that matches a protein coding gene? And if it doesn't, then it marks it as five prime degraded products so in red. And so what you see here uh, in this genome browser view is that the orange is the isoseq read and then the dark red is the ensemble read. So indeed, that's, this is five prime um, degraded and you know it helps you identify when that happens so that you don't have that same issue where we had before where we didn't actually know that we had the full five prime end or not so just to give you an idea of what you get from all this um we did an nice seq annotation for chicken and what we identified was uh, about fifty-two thousand genes and three hundred thousand transcripts and i know this seems high but i'll explain it in a second but I want to compare this to the ensemble annotation for chickens before they used our ICC data set. And what I want to point out is they had 15,000 genes, or actually about 16, 17,000 genes with about 17,000, 18,000 transcripts. So basically no alternative uh, uh, transcript information or very little. And they also didn't have any long non-coding RNA predictions or nonsense mediated decay predictions. So with the ICC data, we were able to pick up a lot more of these things. And my research actually, um, focused on long non-coding RNAs. So the 52,000 genes, a large number, about 38,000 of those genes were, were long non-coding RNA. And uh, the reason why it doesn't quite add up if you compare coding versus non-coding is that uh, there's also uh, sense exonic link RNA genes in there. And so that's another thing that IsoSeq or long retranscript sequencing can get you if you kind of do the library preparation in the right way, essentially. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, my uh, supervisors at the Ross Institute, uh, Alan and Jacqueline, uh, the, uh, my, our, the, our lab tech, Kasha, who's really been helpful with this, uh, everyone at Lexgen who's been really kind of helping me with uh, using the Teleprime kit and also making improvements, and uh, my, my um, PhD supervisor, Dave Burt, and his postdoc, Yun Yun. Uh, thank you very much, and I guess now we can open up for questions. Yes, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, as a quick reminder to our webinar participants, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A panel. And we would also like to ask our attendees to take a brief moment after the webinar has ended to take our exit survey and provide us with your feedback. So with that, let's get into the Q&A. Um, let me see. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about the CAP selection? Um, you highlighted the benefits of doing that, and the question there's a question whether there are any RNA species that are artificially selected for when you do CAP selection. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by artificially selected for, uh, but... Yeah, the I question mean, referred to small poly A stretches or others being amplified, and if so, at what frequency? Ah, uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, there there are issues with the uh, oligo DT primers, like I said before. That that's not specific to five prime cap selection. That's for any kind of uh, sort of full length cDNA method right now because they all use oligo DT primers. And so, obviously, if your transcript has an internal stretch of A's then the DT primer could bind to that instead of the true five prime end. So that's an issue. And then also, I mean, there are, you know, um, RNAs that don't have five prime caps and don't have poly tails. And so you won't get those. But the, the issue there is that you, you wouldn't really be able to identify them anyway because they would look like noise or you, you wouldn't really be able to tell if they're noise or not um, unless you had really high coverage. So when long retranscript sequencing becomes ridiculously cheap, then we can use sort of the short read mentality, bring back the coverage thing to give statistical information about whether something's real or not. But until then, you, you kind of have to uh, adapt, essentially. Okay, thank you. Um, 
there's a question whether Tama works for ISOSEEK on the RS2, the PacBio RS2. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I meant to talk more about uh, sort of uh, overall long transport sequencing, including nanopore. So Tama is not uh, specific to any technology, so it just takes the long reads after mapping. Um, so yeah, it can work with RS2, it can work with SQL, it can work with SQL2, it can work with nanopore, direct RNA, cDNA, cDNA amplified. It, it just is after, is post mapping. And so they all have like the same post mapping situation. They're all the same at that level, essentially. Okay, um, other question about Tama. Um, somebody wants to know why you would use Tama when there's no reference genome. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, if there's no reference genome, you can't use Tama. Um, and I'm actually work, currently working on a referenceless way of annotating, um, but that it's actually quite problematic. And so if you do want to do referenceless annotation, then you'll have to use something like Cogent, which is developed by Liz Tseng at PacBio. Um, and so you can look up uh, on their site how to do that. But it's still kind of problematic. And so uh, the reason being is that it's, if you look at the complexity, so let me see if I can just go back to one of my models. Um, one second. Yeah, if we look at this sort of complexity here uh, of all these different transcripts, uh, that dark blue one on the right, you know, that that might map with each other, and then you might say, okay, they're the same gene, and in that case, you'd be right. But that also, like the single exon one, could be from something completely different that just happens to have an overlap with that transcript there. So when you don't have the reference, uh, you can't use structure as an inference, and so um, it becomes a lot more complex. Now, there is a way to kind of get around it, which is what I'm working on, but uh, right now, um, the, it, it's not like that. And, and the reason why I'm working on it now is because with Chem 3.0, the quality of the sequences are so high that it becomes more feasible to do this reference list because you don't really need the reference um, correction as much, essentially. And, so, and you also have fewer issues with like, uh, erroneous alignments, essentially. OK, thanks. Uh, we got a bunch of questions relating to nanopore sequencing. Um, I wonder if maybe you can address some of those. So one of them is, can you use the TAMA tools with nanopore direct RNA sequencing? Yeah, actually, so there was, there's like a public um, uh, da data set of nanopore, direct RNA, cDNA, and cDNA amplified, which I've been working with. And yeah, you can use TAMA for those, uh, because basically you just, you have, after you do your processing, if you map your direct RNAs onto the genome, then Tama just takes over from there. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's actually Tama is a good good way of looking at it because since it gives you the error reports and like very detailed error reports, one of the issues with direct RNA sequencing is, with Oxford Nanopore is it's really high in errors. And um, and so a lot of I, I feel like a lot of the tools that are designed for uh, the this sort of thing or like Tama like tools. Um, are too lenient, essentially. So they allow you to have too many errors. Whereas Tama, you can tweak it so you can allow a lot of errors, but you can also be more specific and be like, look, um, I just want to make sure that the models are good. So just like you can have errors within the exons, but not near the splice junctions or the, tr or the exon ends. And so, yes, Tama does work with the direct RNA. And actually, I think it's a good idea because, and I said, and like with the OMD, another thing with the direct RNA is that you're going to have degraded products. So the ORF and MD prediction will help you identify when your product is uh, degraded or not, essentially. Okay, thanks. Uh, somewhat related question, how does Tama compare with Nanopore's own polishing and collapsing pipeline, which is called Pinfish? Yeah, so I've been, I'm looking at Pinfish, um, and uh, I haven't gone too deeply into it, but as far as I can see so far, Pinfish is very similar to, like, the tofu or the cupcake collapse, so it's, like, the same idea is basically you assume there's going to be five prime degradation so you collapse based on no cap algorithm and then <clears throat> the thing with pinfish which i need to look into more is i don't think you can tweak it so much with respect to the error rates like uh especially like the errors near the splice junctions which are more important um and so that that can be problematic um so i i need to look into pinfish a bit more but so far from what I've seen, it doesn't 
give as much information as Tama. And um, I didn't have time to really go into like all the information that Tama gives you, but I'll be talking at Smart Leiden. Um, I don't know if they'll record it, but if anyone's going to Smart Leiden, I'll be talking about it and then I'll publish my slides uh, going into sort of what, how you can actually use the Tama thing. Also, I'm working on a blog. I'm going to be creating a blog so to, as like a cookbook for Tama to show you like all the things you can do essentially. Okay, thanks. And then more generally, what is your experience with Oxford Nanopore data given its high, higher error profile? Yeah, so uh, direct RNA is really bad. I think this is really off the top of my head, but essentially something like I think 20% of the reads were somewhat usable because of the high error rates. Um, so basically only 20% mapped with enough uh, like uh, coverage and identity to kind of meet thresholds. Um, the cDNA was slightly better. Um, the problem is that for transcriptome or transcript discovery and annotation, I think direct RNA is not that good uh, because it's just, it's too much ambiguity there with respect to the error rates. But with quantification, it obviously it, it has theoretically a greater power for doing quantification. So I suspect like in the future, you would do your annotations using um, either something like IceSeq or R2C2 with Nanopore, where you get really you know, high accurate reads. Um, and then you could do quanti like log read quantification using direct RNA. Um, that being said, uh, you know, Nanopore is claiming that they, with the flip-flop algorithm and the new pores, they're gonna get something like 95% quality scores. I haven't really seen anybody really do that yet, like non-Nanopore do it, so we'll, we'll see. But even 95% isn't that great. So I see currently with 100 KB average read scores, like they literally get you like a um, a long read transcript sequence on average that has a higher quality score than an Illumina read. So you know it's <clears throat> right now it's leading more towards IsoSeq. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody asked whether there's a need to systematically run a cap and a no cap library. Um, as this increases the cost, and is it possible to skip the second one? Uh, so I actually had this conversation with someone just recently about running also no cap library to pick up, you know, the things that aren't capped, or also just to not have as any bias from the capping. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I think that unless you get enough coverage to resolve things in the non cap situation, it's not going to really help you that much. Um, I do want to say that if you do use Teleprime version 2, one thing that we notice is that like you, you don't want to over amplify. A lot of the issues I've seen with uh, using Teleprime is like people over amplify and then that causes issues with uh, the, the complexity of your samples. It actually denormalizes um, for some reason. So I don't know. I, do, I don't really see that much benefit right now for doing non-cap selected libraries. Um, unless you're truly, like you know that you have a gene that isn't 5 prime cap selected or is degraded like instantly so you, you won't find it 5 prime cap selected. Um, other than that, uh, I don't think there, there is a reason. Um, as long as you kind of follow the directions of Teleprime carefully and don't over, because there was like a, a paper in Archive, BioArchive recently doing um, Nanopore using the Teleprime kit and they amplified like 30 to 40 cycles, which is insane, and that caused issues. Um, but so if you don't do that, then you should be fine. Okay, thanks. Uh, clarification, uh, clarification question. Uh, how do you identify the five, five prime cap from the RNA seq read? I mean, so like a transcript assembler will look for a peak, a drop off. So let me uh, go to that thing here. Right, so on this bottom thing, Basically, it would identify it by a peak drop-off. So if you look at that 5 prime end, it would identify that transcription start site. So that's what transcriptome assemblers do for short read. But the problem is that um, it could be that you just didn't have much coverage in the 5 prime end. Um, so people will supplement with something like cage seek or rampage seek. Uh, but I mean, it's not ideal. I mean, if you can do long read sequencing with 5 prime cap selection, you kind of solve your, all your problems. Uh, I just don't think short read is a really good way of doing transcriptome annotations anymore, given that log read has become much more affordable uh, and also much better in terms of uh, the realistic error rates and things like that. So 
Okay, thanks. Uh, question, other question regarding the Teleprime kit. Is it quantitative, and can you quantify the RNA at the end, or is it just for genome annotation? Well, <clears throat> it doesn't. I, so, in terms of quantitative, uh, long read, I don't think is really there yet for quantitative because you need really high throughput. So, I know this isn't quite answering your question, but like, uh, there's a paper on BioArchive. Uh, I forgot. It, it's just look for nanopore like uh, RNA quantification, and you'll find it. And um, to kind of go through it, and essentially, the amount of throughput you need for true quantification is not where we're at right now, really. And so if you're trying to do quantification, and I think it's too much to ask right now to do quantification and transcript annotation, if that makes any sense. Now, Teleprime itself, um, I'm not sure about it in terms of biasing, in terms of the number of reads you get. But as I said, if you over amplify, then you will bias. And so that's that's one concern if you use Teleprime. The other thing is that if you have a written, if you have like a sample that was not um, kept in good conditions or you know whatever like it wasn't a good uh, sampling then you're going to have a low RIN score typically and a low RIN score means that you have a lot of degraded products so then you're just going to pick up what's left non-degraded and so that's going to be different from your actual quantification essentially so in that situation if you truly want to do like quantification then yeah I, I guess you wouldn't do non-cap selected but still the amount of read coverage that you would need is, is super high most people I think wouldn't really be able to afford it. And if you're paying for that anyway, you might as well like throw in a cap selected one just to verify that, you know, what your models look like. All right. Uh, other question about the Teleprime kit. Teleprime kit, is it possible to use poly A enriched MRI with mRNA with that kit? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, the kit uses a DT primer just like all the other kits, so Yep, that's it. That should be fine, I think. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and a question about um, the other end of the area. So the five prime cap capture is good for removing five prime end de degradation products, but how about three prime end de degradation? Um, what can you do about that? <clears throat> so the three prime uh, is basically the. the their solution, all of the kits, is they use the DT primer, right? Look for the poly A tail. Uh, if you, so basically you're kind of selecting for full length transcripts. Now, like I said before, you can have internal priming. So if it's a degraded product, you'd only pick it up if it had a stretch of poly A's that the DT primer could bind to internally. Uh, with Tama Collapse, it actually gives you a file of all possible candidates that had sort of internal truncation or internal priming. Um, <clears throat> so you can see if, like a model is truncated on three prime end using that uh, output. So again, like uh, Tom Claps has a bunch of outputs that give you this kind of um, uh, sort of quality control on your data set. Yeah. Okay. And have you tried probe selection of link RNAs? Right. So actually, I think there was a paper published recently about doing probe selection of link RNAs, and and that's a great it's a great way of doing it because the problem with link RNAs is that they're low they're typically lowly expressed. Uh, there's a caveat to that, which actually I'm publishing soon. But um, the the issue with using probes for link RNAs is uh, you need to know where the link RNAs are first, right? So if you're and link RNAs are not well conserved across species, so you know if you want to do a, a discovery of link RNAs as, as opposed to a verification of link RNAs, it doesn't your probe thing doesn't work. Um, because you, you don't know which probes to use, essentially. Um, so that's, you know, that's one of the things is, like, you'd have to do a, a, just a standard sequencing thing first to identify the link RNAs before you could do the probe-based one. Um, so it's kind of catch-22 there. Right, got that. Mm -hmm. Another question regarding to the Teleprime kit, does it work with degraded RNA? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, so it's just from my experience, it works with degraded RNA, but the, you know, the problem is if like 50% of the RNA in your sample is degraded, that means that, you know, your effective concentration is, so say you had a two, you estimated two micrograms of RNA, but 50% was degraded, then your effective, uh, actual amount is one microgram. So if you have a RIN score of like six and you run teleprime, you're of course going to get 
uh, lower yields than if you ran a, a standard library prep where it would include all the degraded ones. So this I always like talk to people about because it's like it's kind of an interesting thing where they're like, well, my RNA is really degraded, so I should run the standard prep. But if your RNA is really degraded, that means that most of your data is going to be degraded RNA, which is not not as useful. So <laughs> it's kind of like you're you've already conceded that using um, the standard library is going to give you bad data, essentially. All right, thanks. A um, couple of questions regarding the reference genome you use. Uh, do you have to use a reference that's the same species as the transcriptome sample, or can you use a reference of a closely related one? I obviously you want as close as possible. You could try it on a closely related one. Um, I mean, you can always just try it and map it and see. Um, the problem is that the protein coding regions will typically be uh, well conserved, but the UTRs, so the untranslated regions on the ends, and the link RNAs will not be conserved. So those won't really map very well. And so the issue is that you kind of get the same situation as if you're just doing a homology-based, like Augustus approach to annotation. So it just depends on how far away you are, how different the genomes are. And I mean, and so yeah, I've, uh, some of my collaborators are dealing with the same situation, and that's why um, I'm working on a referenceless way of, of um, doing the, the transcriptome annotation. But it's going to be quite a paradigm shift because uh, in order to do, in my opinion, referenceless uh, transcriptome annotation properly, you have to shift to a graph-based approach. And I think this is gonna be kind of like a muffet for a lot of people because it, it's a very different way of looking at the transcriptome essentially. All right. Uh, can you, for one of your slides, can you clarify the depth of sequencing you used for for getting the level of annotation for the chicken genome that you showed? Uh, was that a single isoseq run, or was it from multiple runs? Uh, that's m multiple runs. Uh, a lot of runs, actually, because um, <clears throat> we started with RS2. I'm just going to the slide now. Uh, we started with RS2, and we did something like, so RS2 was like 150K ZMWs per smart cells, and we had about like 20 to 30 um, per sample. So there's two samples. It was a brain and embryo. Um, and then we did uh, about one or two smart cells for four other tissues. Um, it was uh, macrophage, spleen, ovaries, and testes. Um, and so... But then I did extra for the brain to do some of the comparisons. So I did probably maybe like six more smart cells on the brain. So it's quite a, a collection. But I will say RS2 was like a whole different thing. So uh, SQL with the Chem 3.0 is a completely different game. The amount of data you get off of that is just insane. And then if you use SQL 2, that's going to be obviously uh, an even, even bigger boom to the number of um, your sequencing depth, essentially. Okay, thanks. A uh, couple of questions relating to ISOSeq. First of all, does ISOSeq work with FFPE samples? Sorry, can you say that again? Uh, Sorry, does ISOSeq work with FFPE samples? Uh, I'm not really sure what FFPE is, actually. <clears throat> uh, let me look it up. <laughs> Or could you clarify what, what you mean by FFPE? Uh, uh, basically, uh, fixed tissues, prominent hmm. fixed tissues. Hmm. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I had a discussion with someone about this recently. Um, sorry, I'm bad with acronyms because there's a lot floating around. Um, yeah, so not well. Actually, even short read RNA seq doesn't work super well with it because it can be super fragmented. Um, so. <clears throat> No. <laughs> Unfortunately, like uh, okay. when you have a formula fixed thing, it's not, yeah. Okay, great. And then uh, maybe the last question uh, with the column normalization method, is that already incorporated in the ISOSeq sample prep library? No, not at all. Um, <clears throat> we initially had our column normalization done by GATC, but they no longer do that. And so now we're developing our own protocol. And um, Dave Burt is now, he's my PhD supervisor, he's now at University. Queensland, he's helping a column-based protocol. And so uh, we, I, I basically am just trying to optimize my column-based one right now. So a lot of people have been asking me about it, um, but uh, it's I need some more time to work on it. And then also I'm trying to finish up my PhD. So it's getting 
a little bit uh, stretched in terms of the things <laughs> that are being done. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I know we have a lot of questions, but this is actually all the time we have today for questions. So with that, let me thank our speaker, Richard Kuo, and our sponsor, Lexogen. And if we didn't have time to get to your question, we will try to follow up with you after the webinar. As a quick reminder, please look out for the survey after you log out to provide us with your feedback. And uh, thank you again for attending this genome webinar.